thank you most of all for inviting me here because I hope that you will share the concerns that I have. And they're very, very deep felt concerns about my profession, journalism, and about what uh, people nowadays call the mainstream media, uh, MSM or something that sounds like a new disease. It's in trouble. It's in crisis. Uh, and not just a crisis like the airlines or even General Motors. It's something that goes far deeper than that. Because the, the mainstream media have lost the confidence of the public. And when they lose the trust of the public, they have lost the most precious thing they have. I mean, I'll give you some examples. I saw a short while ago a poll which said that 45% of Americans, get this, 45% of Americans believe little or nothing of what they read in their daily newspapers. I could hardly believe it. Then I saw another statement, this based on other polls in a report called The State of the Media, put out by Columbia University School of Journalism and, and the Pew Foundation. And this is what they reported. Americans think journalists are sloppier, less professional, less moral, less caring, more biased, less honest about their mistakes, and generally more harmful to democracy than they did in the 1980s. How in the world did we get there? What's happened to our media? But what's happened is that they have lost their sense of mission. What is the mission? What is the mission of journalism? What's the mission of the news? It's to get out there and find out what's coming down the road, to try to make some sense of it, to try to explain it to you, give it a little context, and perhaps, if we're lucky, to warn you about troubles ahead. That's the mission. Well, we've all seen 9-11. But how in the world did we get to that point? The point where Americans would suddenly have to ask, why do they hate us? What does they have against us? On that day, I realized that we had not only failed miserably to carry out our mission, we had failed dangerously. How did we get there? Let me take you back a little bit. When I joined CBS back in 1970, I was one of three correspondents in the Rome Bureau. Now, we have no Rome Bureau, and if you take all of the bureaus that CBS has around the world, you could count them on the fingers of one hand and you still have a finger left over. And as for correspondents, foreign correspondents, all of our great, once great team of correspondents around the world, you could count those on the fingers of two hands and you'd have several fingers left over. CBS and ABC and NBC, and I'm talking mostly about the big terrestrial broadcasters because that is where most Americans get their news. Perhaps not you all, because you're smarter, you know there are other places to go, but most people turn on the tube, as they say in Britain, and, and get their news there. But what happened? What happened? Why did they demobilize? Well, for one thing, it used to be that the broadcasters got free use of the airways, as they still do, in other countries, they pay for their bit of the spectrum. But in America, they're given that piece of the spectrum for nothing. And in return, they were supposed to provide you, the Americans who own those airwaves, a public service. And one of the main public services was supposed to be news, real news, not infotainment, not Michael Jackson, not diet fads, but things that are vitally important, things happening out there, happening beyond our shores. Well. That was expensive. It was very, very expensive. <clears throat> and the networks decided to start lobbying the FCC, which represents your, your interests, and got the FCC to drop the requirement 
for public service. And that left them free to go after what was their real interest, which was the bottom line. Because it used to be said, it's, in CBS, for example, the news division was called the, the jewel in the crown. It was the loss leader. And this is something that we did to fulfill our public duty. The real, the dirty little secret behind all of this, known only to a small group of people, insiders, is that they always made money with news. But they began to make really big money when 60 Minutes came along. 60 Minutes in the mid-1970s became the biggest news program anywhere. And they used to hide the profits. They would attribute the profits of 60 Minutes to the network, to the entertainment division, not the news division. And, and moreover, they would start, they'd fool around with the books. They had a special CBS division called CBS Operations, which would uh, provide the editors and editing equipment to 60 Minutes at outrageous prices. Now, I know this because a friend of mine was, uh, became vice president, and he found out when they tried to outsource or they tried to put out for bids these services at reasonable prices, they were told, no, 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 no. Well, eventually, 60 Minutes began to make such obscene amounts of money, I mean, really big, big money. They couldn't hide it anymore. And so that's when they started, that's when they started to lobby to get rid of the public service requirement. Something else happened at the same time. The end of the Cold War. And the people, the, the multi, the mega corporations who own the, the news organizations decided it was time to cash in on the peace dividend. The only problem was we weren't at peace. We had the 1993 attack against the World Trade Center, and if that wasn't enough of a wake-up call, there was the attack at Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia in the mid-1990s, which blew up a number of American servicemen. There was the attack on two American embassies in Africa in the latter 1990s, and then they blew up the USS Cole in the, in the Yemen at the end of the 1990s. Now, we, the foreign correspondents, the people who are working for the mainstream media, <clears throat> we reported these facts, but we were never given the time, the money, uh, or could we get past the gatekeepers to really connect the dots for you, our audience, to tell you who these people were who were trying to blow Americans to bits and why they wanted to blow us to bits. And as, as has already been mentioned, I tried at one time to get, and this was 1996, an interview with uh, Osama bin Laden on CBS. And they weren't interested. And the bottom line was the bottom line. They didn't want to spend the money to send me and a team to Afghanistan. It wouldn't have been big bucks because they didn't think it was of interest to you, the public. It's, it's a truism in the business, and it's a truism that is, I think, false, that foreign news is bad for ratings. And of course, when consultants tell the television executives that, they're pushing against an open door because foreign news is twice as expensive to do as local news. And so CBS, NBC, ABC did exactly the same thing that our government did at the end of the Cold War. We demobilized. Our government did the same thing with their intelligence services. They got rid of the boots on the ground, the eyes and the ears out there, closed down the bureaus, got rid of foreign correspondents with the results that you have seen. Remember, I don't know if, if you, how many people here actually watch CBS or NBC or ABC evening news? Good audience. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's not a majority. It's a long way from it. Remember the summer leading up to 9-11. What was the big story on network television? Those of you who were watching it then. Shark attacks. Shark attacks. Remember? And it wasn't even a bad shark summer. <laughs> but it was cheap. All you had to do was call up video from your affiliates, and it was sexy footage, and you put it on the air, and, and that was news. Now, there was, there was no excuse whatsoever for the owners and the network executives not to know what was going on, because in January 2001, there was a very credible government commission, the Hart Rudman Commission, which looked into terrorism and reported that at some point, Americans 
would die on American soil as a result of a terrorist attack and possibly in large numbers. Even their report wasn't reported by most of the mainstream media. Well, the problem has gotten to the point now where I think we're in danger. That the, the networks, the mainstream media, have dumbed down the public, you, to the point where you don't even know what you're missing. You know, it's, it's the unknown unknowns, I suppose, that Rumsfeld would talk about. You don't know what you're missing out there, what's going on. And instead, before I do that, let me give you one more little example. If we have time, I'm not, I've been told I have 25 minutes, so I've got a, a, I'm, I'm from the world of the minute 45, so this is a great luxury for me. <laughs> let me tell you the story about Mohammed Atta, who, as you remember, was the ringleader of the 9-11 attacks. Several months before he carried out the attacks, he arrived in America, went to Florida, went to a U.S. Department of Agriculture loan officer and asked for a loan to get a plane, small plane, take out the seats and put in a great big tank and use it as a crop duster. Well, this loan officer thought it was crazy, it was silly, a silly idea, and she turned him down. And then Mohammed Adel saw a photograph on the wall of her office, and it was an aerial photo of Washington, D.C., and he asked her to point out where the Pentagon was and where the White House was. And then he started to talk to her about an organization of people overseas who are deeply dissatisfied with their governments. It was called Al-Qaeda. It didn't mean a thing to her. She never heard of it. Because in the three months leading up to 9-11, there was no mention whatsoever on the network even news, evening news of Al-Qaeda. And then she mentioned the name of a man, Osama bin Laden, who someday would be known around the world. Didn't mean a thing to her. After the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, she saw Mohammed Atta's picture in the paper, good Lord, and went to the FBI. And indeed, it turns out that the original plan of the 9-11 attackers was to take small planes, fill them full of explosives, and crash them into tall buildings. Now, there's, there's a might have been if we'd been doing our jobs if the networks had been doing their jobs, if the gatekeepers, the people who decide what goes on the air, had been doing their jobs and hadn't turned their, their backs on the world. Well, you would hope it's better now, should be better. But there was a brief period of a real flurry of activity after 9-11, and CBS and NBC and the others threw all the assets they could into reporting. I went zooming around Germany in the back alleys of Hamburg looking for Al-Qaeda types. I went to Pakistan, uh, uh, to, to talk to the Taliban, but it didn't last. It didn't last. We didn't have the troops. We had been demobilized to the point that when uh, the war against Afghanistan came along, they had to send out gossip columnists and people like this, people who had absolutely no clue as to what was going on. I would like to say we're better, but we're not better. So we're not reporting. What we're doing in, in a large sense is really we're outsourcing if you still those of you who still watch the the network evening news most of the foreign news you see and there isn't much of it there's about one story a night and it's usually Iraq most of what you see isn't reported by the networks or shot by the networks it's packaged packaged in London or packaged in New York the networks buy in video from agencies video shot by Lord knows whom, somebody who has what agenda you don't know and who also may not have taken pictures of some things that he, did, he couldn't take pictures of because to, uh, to get along in some countries you have to go along. They take this video, they take wire service copy, wrap it around that, put a correspondent's face on it and call that ABC News or NBC News or CBS News. It's not. It's deceptive and I think potentially in some cases it's dangerous because you don't have the facts to vouch for what you put on the air. And we've seen the problems that happen, it can happen when you don't have the facts to back it up. If also to get out of, say to get out of the London Bureau to go out and, and report, occasionally you do actually go out on, 
on, on the scene, you have to present your network bosses with a budget. You have to tell them what you're going out for, what you're going to come back with, which means essentially uh, you can't go out and look for news. You've got to go out with a preconceived notion. And parachuting, which is what they do when they go out, you, you send somebody out at the last minute, parachuting is too late. You should be there when it's, there's smoke, not when the fire's broken out already. And of course, the poor correspondent who's parachuted out, they didn't have a clue about what's going on. Yet, the minute he hits the ground, they, give him, they link him up with an uplink, and he has to start reporting. But all he's doing is rehashing, basically, what either someone has told him there, his, his local fixer, who once again may or may not have an agenda, or what you're getting from the local wires. There's very little, in addition to the problems of packaging and parachuting, there's very little explanation or context right now. I remember watching a few months back the network coverage of the election in Ukraine. You may or may not remember it, but it, it was on the air. And if you watched the network coverage, you would have come away uh, having learned this, that uh, there were two groups of people in Ukraine. One spoke Russian, the other spoke Ukraine. There was an election. There was some hanky-panky with the election. The results were overturned, and the pro-Western guy won. But almost entirely missing from this report was this great overarching story that Russia's President Putin had made a very heavy-handed attack, an, an attempt to influence the election and to claw back what had once been an essential part of the Soviet Union. But if you didn't get that, it was about as interesting, interesting to you as, say, some, a little report on, a, on an election in Brazil, which, by the way, we don't cover. <laughs> we don't cover Latin America. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll give you a quick quiz. Try to guess. We'll take CBS, my former employees. Try to guess how many full-time correspondents CBS News has covering the Muslim world out there, you know, in the territory, assigned to it, how many correspondents do you think they have? Zero. Zero. You're right. Zip. Not one. And it's the same with the other networks. You know, there's an awful lot of talk right now about uh, bias or, or spin. Uh, it's all within our business and uh, in the public, and it's all about right-left. The problem's not right-left. It's what's left out. It's what you don't know about. I mean, do you know we have something, if you can, if you can believe an author who's, who's made a study of it, we've got something like 700 military bases around the world, 700 plus. Do we know why they're there? Do we, do we know if they're welcome there? Do we know what our government is doing in our names? Is there any way we can monitor that? Certainly not from, uh, not from your evening news or from most of the, the mainstream media. There is so little real reporting. Well, you say, fine, we've got 24-hour news services now. We've got, we've got Fox, you know, we give you the facts and, um, f well, we, we give you, we tell you what to believe and then they don't give you very many facts. But the problem with all of these 24-hour news services is they do very little reporting. There's very little and certainly not investigative reporting, which is the most expensive thing of all. They rewrite the wire services. They give you, uh, they chew it over. They give you their opinions, but they don't give you facts. And the greatest antidote to spin, and uh, the current government is pretty good at this, is facts. Spin proliferates in a vacuum. Bias proliferates in a vacuum. And the antidote is facts, actual facts. Tell them what's going on out there. Well, what could we do? I mean, if, if we've reached this point where you're not getting the, the facts, and certainly not in your evening news. Incidentally, when you, if you watch network evening news, you get in that half hour about 18 minutes of news. That's the news hole. And of that 18 minutes, only the first half is really news. It's sort of like a headline service at the, t at the top. And the rest of it is the stuff to keep them in the tent. You know, that's where you get the diet fads. That's where you get not one, maybe two health stories and 
all the rest. In fact, I, can re I recall not so long ago a long period in which one of the major networks had said nothing, absolutely nothing, zip at all about Africa, nothing about the Congo, where there's the risk of another huge, huge, huge conflagration. Lots, lots of lives are at, at stake there. Or Darfur, where tens of thousands have died. The one thing during this recent period of several months when I watched them that they put on the air from Africa was a chimpanzee smoke cigarettes. You may have seen that. You probably remember it. Now, that's outrageous. They, the people who put the news on the air, the people who control the networks, think you have, A, they think you can't handle, you can't take on board complex facts. They think you have the attention span of a gnat. Well, I think that's outrageous. And they should be ashamed of even suggesting that you're not smart enough to take on board things that concern your lives and mine. You know, some people say, I come from a different age now. You know, there's old Fenton. He, there were different standards when he was doing the news. Well, I tell you, I think people who say that, they're the ones who are living in a dream world because this is not the world as it used to be. This is a world in which there are people out there trying to get their hands, believe me, trying to get their hands on radiological, chemical, and biological weapons. And God help us, they would love to get their hands on a nuclear device. And if they did, they would try to blow it up in a major American city. That is the world that we live in. And that's not the world you hear a lot about on our news. What can we do? That's a tough one. One suggestion, one suggestion that Dan Rather made constantly, and he was always rebuffed, um, and others have made in our business, is to take the half-hour evening news, expand it to an hour. But not just, not an hour full of Michael Jackson and all, but an hour of, of real news, context, and put it in prime time. Because most of us are pretty busy. Not many people, what time is it on the air here in the evening? 5.30? 7? 5.30 and 6. Most of us are doing something else at the time. Run it later in the, in, in the evening. The problem is this is where the local stations make their money, and there's, there's big resistance to this. <coughs> Cable news, as I point out, is, is not the answer, because you're not, you're not getting facts. You're getting, you're getting a rehash of, uh, of stuff. Those of us who, who work the internet, of course, we know there's a lot there. The problem is this business of the unknown unknowns. We don't know exactly what to look for. If you're, if you're very smart and you're very cued in, that's perhaps the best place you can go to right now. Um, local news, forget it. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, someone, someone, and, and <clears throat> that's not because the people who, who work in local news don't try. It's because of what they're allowed to do. Another survey shows that in, in a recent three months period, the average amount of time on the evening news of local television stations devoted to Iraq was 25 seconds. Is there some way we can, we can improve things? Well, there is one little bright light on the horizon. For me, that's National Public Radio. I know it's in, it's in trouble right now, and the government's trying to cut public broadcasting uh, financing. But they do international news. They do things that are happening beyond our shores, things that will affect your lives. They do context. And their audience has grown by leaps and bounds. In the last 20 years, it's gone from 2 million listeners a week to 30 million, 30 million. And they're doing the right thing. What can you do? I don't know. I mean, your, your local stations, you know, they, they get these licenses free of charge. They get the airways. Their licenses come up. You know, if you don't think they're doing the job they should be doing, you can write to the FCC. You can write to your local station. I'm not sure that the FCC will, will help. It's been pretty much of a toothless tiger in recent years, about the only thing I've seen them really, really clamp down on was the uh, Janet Jackson's wardrobe mishap. And boy, 
did uh, CBS was the network involved. Boy, did they stand up and salute then. So theoretically, the FCC has the power to ask the purveyors of news to give you real news, not pseudo news, not, not entertainment. I'm afraid, however, that this is not going to happen until you, you the public, you the electorate, are fed up to the point where you're going to put pressure on them. You're going to demand, demand something better. Uh, I don't know how many of you recall the 1976 film Network News with the script by Patty Chayefsky. Uh, there's a network that's in trouble. There's an aging alcoholic anchor who uh, he, he's got bad ratings uh, and he's told he'll be fired. So he goes in two weeks and he goes on the air the next day and he announces he's got to commit suicide on the air. Wow, what a reaction. You know, the, the phones, the sh switchboard lights up and the next day he kind of changes his mind, but he becomes an angry prophet. And on the air, he says, so I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window. Open it and stick your heads out and yell, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. And that's my message to you.